When we talk about education, what's really at stake in the city of Dallas, in the state of Texas, and for the future prosperity and good life for so many in our communities? Find out more with Todd Williams of the Commit Partnership. He'll be talking about that with me on Good God coming up. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm George Mason, your host, and I'm pleased to welcome to the program today, Todd Williams, who is the founder chairman and CEO of the Commit Partnership in Dallas, an education advocacy group, and we're delighted to have you. Glad Thank to be you here. Thank you for being here. Todd, it's, uh, uh, it's a big challenge to, uh, to take on the whole uh, reform of public education in Texas and all its permutations, but you have had big vision about this and you have a tremendous team working on this. And I'd like us to sort of take on some very specific issues about this because uh, we have a lot pressing in Texas mm -hmm. and in Dallas as well uh, that is uh, uh, really critical for the success of the next generation. Uh, and one of those things is coming up in DISD uh, and is actually happening in some other school districts as well. Mm -hmm. And it's called the TRE that we'll be voting on uh, in November. Mm -hmm. That is the, the, the tax ratification election. Mm -hmm. And tell us what a TRE is and why it should matter to people. So under state law, uh, if you want to be able to uh, raise your taxes to provide for more operating dollars for a school district, you have to go to the voters for approval. It requires six. Of, it requires two thirds of the board to support putting it on the ballot, which happened in this last August. And so now we have this election coming up, and the the, the net effect of this election is that if approved, uh, it will generate around uh, six hundred plus dollars more per student. But given the size of Dallas ISD, that's about one hundred and twenty-five million dollars mm -hmm. um, to basically. And the reason that that I'm supportive of it and others. Uh, are supportive of it is that it will can hopefully continue to provide the the resources needed to spread the tremendous improvements that Dallas has been undergoing over the past five to six years with you know, significant expansion of full day pre-k even though the state only funds half the district funds the balance of that uh, expansion of early colleges expansion of schools of choice uh, ba basically paying our better teachers and principals more and sooner uh, under a, a rigorous evaluation system versus historically it was seniority-based pay. They've done an amazing number of reforms that have now served as almost a model for other urban districts in Texas to look at. Uh, and particularly one other thing I should highlight, figuring out who your better teachers are and then financially incenting them to go to your schools that need their expertise the most, wow. which historically did not exist. Right. And it's been a big driver in Dallas going from 43 improvement required schools as rated by the state to four in uh, four years. I really want us to take on some of the objections that people raise mm -hmm. to these sorts of things and, and sure. ask you to, to comment on them. You and I have been uh, in Dallas for a very long time. I, you grew up here and went mm -hmm. to Brian Adams High School, so right. uh, even more so than my nearly 30 years here. But the, the narrative about DISD yeah. uh, has always been that there's always enough money, it's mismanaged, and of course there have been scandals through the years of financial mismanagement and, right. and poor leadership. Uh, but address that uh, particularly right now. I mean, what do you see in the leadership and the management of Dallas Independent School District? Well, I, I see great leadership in Dr. Hinojosa and his cabinet, and I see great leadership at the board level, which I think is really critical. Right. We've got a, there's a solid board that is data-driven, mm -hmm. uh, that it focuses on the right things, mm -hmm. which is student achievement. Right. And at the end of the day, that's what parents and that's what taxpayers provide their resources for, is to make sure that we are publicly educating every single child and giving them a real shot uh, at a uh, quality life through uh, some type of uh, post-secondary credential beyond high school and they play a critical part in that, in that equation. It, a, another thing people often like to say is that uh, the, the, the Teachers Association and the, the, the system of uh, public education uh, is resistant to change and simply wants more money, more money, more money mm -hmm. without uh, being willing to uh, be driven by outcomes and be help, being held accountable. 
but even that's changing, isn't it? It, it really is. I, I, I talk to lots of teachers that welcome accountability. They, mm-hmm. they want to be treated like the professionals that they are. If they're an amazing rock star teacher after four or five years, should they have to wait for 30 years to be paid like that, right. for example? Right. And, and, and they realize part of the program of, of, of figuring out who your better teachers are and relocating them to your more challenged schools is that we're proving that we've, what we've always known, great teachers matter. They always right. have and they always will, and they're, and they're, they're the biggest in-school factor in terms of a student achievement than anything else. So this TRE, if it's approved, will cost me and it'll cost you mm-hmm. more in our taxes. Mm-hmm. On average, probably $150 or so uh, a year. Uh, when you think about the, you know, the average of what we're actually paying. Cost of a latte per week. Well, there you go. A <laughs> latte per week. My goodness. Well, for the sake of possibly transformations in the lives of kids and a change that will be generational for so many people in Dallas County. I think it is absolutely critical. Right now, we, we have the educational attainment we have as a community primarily because we import a tremendous amount of talent from outside the state of Texas. Yeah. Texas is where the jobs are. Yeah. And people are coming from all sorts of places to come here. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we have a lot of kids who grew up in our own school system who were born here who aren't participating in that prosperity. Right. And we owe that to them to, be, to be, have a fair shot uh, at, at participating. If this TRE is approved, the lion's share of this money then will be targeted toward those schools that are most at risk, right? That, that, that have been uh, in need of improvement and the same kinds of uh, reforms that have been in place in DISD will be applied more broadly and strengthened in those schools. Is that is that Absolutely, correct? I think the key strategies of paying our best teachers more putting our best teachers in front of our kids who need them the most, expanding our schools of choice and single gender and dual language and STEM and arts, spreading mm-hmm. those throughout the schools, making sure that every kid who wants to graduate with an associate's degree by the time they graduate from high school has the opportunity to do that. Right. Uh, those all cost money. And we can't continue to have these tough choices of, yeah, we'll do that, but then we gotta lay off these librarians. Right. Or we gotta lay off these counselors. Right. Uh, and when you think about the total spend, what we spend in public schools today, it's plus or minus probably $9,000, 8500 to $9,000 per child. Mm-hmm. I know what people in private school pay per kid, yeah. per child. Yeah. It's significantly more than that, right. and those typically come from, uh, those typically have more resources and at home as well as at the school. And I just think we owe it to our kids to do this. Right. So I, I recently wrote a piece that you commented uh, to me on uh, about uh, the Le- LeBron James's uh, mm-hmm. contribution in Akron, yep. uh, where he gave uh, an extraordinary amount of money to make sure there were wraparound services and promises uh, of, of college and all sorts of things that would go into modeling what a public school could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, among the most at-risk kids in Akron. Mm-hmm. And, and what struck me about that with several things is, is, first of all, simply, isn't that what we want for every kid? Of course. Not just that philanthropy comes in and identifies one neighborhood, one school, or some such thing, but we, right. shouldn't we want that for everyone? Uh, but also uh, that it, it's, it's sometimes necessary for us, if we really love our neighbor, Mm -hmm. Uh, as ourselves, Mm -hmm. and we realize that we have extraordinary opportunity for parental support and wraparound services for our kids, whether it's parental involvement in PTAs, or it's uh, it's mentoring programs, or it's after school programs, or it's uh, extra financial resources that are gathered for those schools, or it's nutrition. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we know those things make up success uh, for a local school, and it's not true down the street Mm -hmm. in in Dallas, then shouldn't we be marshalling our resources to make sure that those schools have the same kind of opportunity that that our schools have? You know, accountability, you mentioned accountability earlier. Accountability goes both ways. We can hold educators accountable, and we should, Mm -hmm. but they need to hold us accountable for owning the supports that they need to do the job that we ask them to do. Um, And and we're not doing it as a community. Dallas ISD, out of 55 school districts in North Texas, has the third lowest tax rate. Uh, Once we get this TRE approved, if it is approved, we'll still be the 40th lowest tax rate. Wow. So, and we have the most poverty and the most English language learners 
Mm -hmm. I don't know how we could justify not investing, again, given the track record in the, in the most recent five to six years of what's happening with this school. I mean, it's a, it's a B-rated district. It, it, it is the highest performing, grow, fastest growing urban school district in the state in terms of academic achievement, a whole host of reforms and improvements and good leadership at the board level and at the administration level. I mean, if not now, when? So where is the sticking point? Wh or the, where are the forces? Sure. Can you identify what those forces are that, that are holding us back from being able to do that? I, I think the forces are different depending on the parts of the city. There are people, and certainly in Southern Dallas, who have an obvious sense of mistrust. Mm -hmm. If we raise our taxes, how, what, what is our assurance that this money will be equitably distributed around the city? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's all about trusting the board, and, and that's mm -hmm. about people going in the community and making sure, and, and just don't watch what I say, watch what I do, yes. right? And so we've created a number of schools where we've put a million dollars per school in these wraparound services with our better teachers, and we've gone from schools that were in the bottom 5% of the state to now being rated A or B within two or three years. Incredible. It wasn't about the kids, it was about the system and the, right. and the wraparound supports. Um, so those are some forces. There are some forces that basically say, those aren't my kids. Yeah, right. And we have to own that and understand that some people feel that way. And, and, uh, but I keep talking about what, what, what community do you want your grandparents to grow up, I mean your grandkids to grow up in? Right. Uh, what neighborhood and community do you want them to be part of? I, I, you, if you go around this country and you go to cities that have not invested well in their education, uh, New Orleans, Memphis, right. those cities don't look like Dallas. No, right. So we, we love to talk about how Dallas works. You know, it's a, it's a phrase we use, and we love to talk about the Dallas story and about how Dallas is open for business. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's sort of a chamber of commerce, right. a kind of way of us talking about Dallas, uh, and yet it's, it, it's a tale of two cities, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, it really is. I mean, the, uh, um, Michelle Kinder over at the Momentus Institute said, well, we need to make Dallas as good for kids as it is for business. Yeah, and yeah. it's not today. And right. it is a tale of two cities. We've got we've got some uh, school districts within our region that have you know the highest SAT and ACT scores in the country, right? Uh, and with great outcomes in terms of what they're able to achieve beyond high school. And then we've got some schools where less than one in ten children get any type of living wage credential. It's incredible, right? Less than one in ten. I mean, it's just yeah. you probably have better chances at the scratch card at Seven Eleven than you would, and and that's just that's indefensible. A lot of people talk about uh, how no matter what you do, it still comes down to the family of origin, the family that surrounds a, a kid. And if mm -hmm. the family is not on board, no matter what you do, there's, there's not going to be success there. But uh, that's not what we're actually finding, is it? I mean, there is a way to do intervention by extraordinary mentors and people mm -hmm. in schools that will help to change a family's trajectory for generations to come, mm -hmm. even if that family doesn't have a history of, of, of promise and of education and all of that. Mm -hmm. My mother is one of the biggest influences in my life and she did not go to college. Right. But she knew education was important and she told me every day, mm -hmm. you're gonna go to college. We'll figure out how to pay for it somehow, you know, through scholarships or financial aid. But it was important. And then I obviously met lots of great mentors in my life who told me about doors that I could open that I had no idea that a door ever existed there. Right. And we can provide the wraparound services. So sometimes it's not just about money, it's just about adult influence in a child's life. So let's talk about that. If someone is watching this program and saying, I'm becoming convicted, I, mm -hmm. I, I really hear what you're saying and I realize how I'm looking for something to do in my life. What are some ways to volunteer, to get involved in edu education locally? So if I had to pick two things, and there are probably lots of other things, but I'd say three things. One, uh, mentor. We're gonna be launching a mentoring program associated with the Dallas County Promise where every student who is in community college is gonna pick a field, mm -hmm. and we'd like to find people who are from that field or experience of that field who Good. can talk and kind of help them navigate that process. Great. Second thing, read to a child. Yeah. It's amazing how important it is. 90% uh, of the brain develops by the age of five, mm -hmm. um, and yet it's only 5% of our public spending in that, those zero to five years. And so we've got to catch kids up who are behind and make sure that they can read. Right. Uh, and then the third thing is there may be some people out there that might want to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of career changers who go into teaching, who have great expertise, uh, particularly as we expand CTE, uh, vocational and career technical education. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of people who really understand lots of things that perhaps your traditional teachers coming out of, um, of, of colleges 
who were not trained in that field or that industry. We need everybody at the, at the putting their shoulder behind it. Terrific. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, some of this volunteerism and advocacy of that. And I want to get in, a, in our second segment, I'd like to talk more about the state's role okay. and funding and, and, and the, the relationship between neighborhood schools, charter schools, yep. and private schools okay. and, and, and all of that. So let's take a break and hear more about Commit, and we'll be right back. Great. The Commit Partnership is focused on the powerful idea that every child in Dallas County should receive an excellent and equitable public education, preparing them to flourish in college and beyond. The partnership works with public and private schools, colleges and universities, foundations, nonprofits and businesses to solve DFW's biggest educational challenges. Find out how you can take the journey with us. Visit thecommitpartnership.org. Back with Todd Williams. Todd, we were talking about ways that people could be involved locally. So there, you mentioned, I think, some ways that individuals can be involved directly in the schools. And uh, mentoring, reading, volunteering, or, or changing careers even in mm -hmm. becoming a teacher. Right. Uh, there are actually organizations that help make that path easier. So Reading Partners, for instance, right. is one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we also have uh, some other groups that have formed, like One Plus One Dallas uh, is, is a new program that uh, is matching church communities mm -hmm. and religious communities, uh, temples and mosques and any other kinds of groups with local schools and involving them in just this, mentoring and, uh, and reading and, uh, and, and other kinds of wraparound services. Mm -hmm. So people can get involved in various ways and sometimes not just by showing up to school and saying, I'm here, put me to work, but working with others who are helping that to take place. I just feel there's a lot of energy. I, everything I see out there, there's more so than I've ever seen. I work with a group called Pastors for Texas Children mm -hmm. that is, is working hard on public school advocacy. Uh, but that brings us, I think, to the, the, the larger question of what happens not just locally, but also in the state. Right. So uh, there's, there's public schools, there are public charter schools, mm -hmm. Uh, and then there are private schools. Mm -hmm. We've, w when it comes to funding education in the state, there, every time the legislature meets, there are efforts to try to get voucher programs through right. that will allow people to make parental choice to move their tax dollars to support uh, their private school. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that, and what's the, the consequence of that struggle as you see it? Well, I, I struggle with vouchers, particularly as they have been proposed, because there really is no accountability that comes with the voucher. Uh, and so, and generally the amounts that have been discussed would not be adequate, for example, for a low-income child to access right. a high-quality private Five, school. Five, six thousand dollars a year. Right. So yeah. I, I feel like instead what it'll do is it will siphon resources away right. from uh, traditional public schools and public charter schools, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we would get the benefit of it. Um, because again, the, what I've heard in terms of where it can be used. Right. So just to clarify for people who haven't really tuned in but are trying to understand this whole landscape of schools, sure. let's talk about charter schools because I think people are familiar with uh, their local neighborhood public school, mm -hmm. which is changing itself because now there tends to be within districts more opportunity to transcend your boundaries and make choices to go up, appeal to other, apply to other schools. But charter schools are part of the education reform process that was giving uh, people a choice within their districts right. uh, to have schools that would be able to innovate in certain ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the outcome of that has been plus and minus, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's been, it has been. Uh, it, it, it's not just been a magic bullet where, uh, right. you know, now Williams Prep, named for you, uh, it has been highly successful, K through 12, uh, but can you talk a little bit about what you see as where we stand with charter schools today? 
I think where we stand with charter schools is that I think there's some great charter schools that do a great job for kids, and I think there's some charter schools that, frankly, I'm not sure they should be a charter school. Okay. Uh, and so I think ultimately it's up to the state to decide who gets to run a charter school and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. But I think the key thing I focus on is I just want great outcomes for kids. Right. And uh, I get less concerned on some of the models and, and governance and all those kind of things, but I, I'm very passionate about making sure that every kid is in a building where they're thriving. And, uh, and I, mean, we, I think I, that's true for traditional school districts and that's true for charter school districts. I think what charters have done in a positive way is that I think they have really caused some traditional districts to focus on expanding their own choice exactly. within, the, within the district. So I yeah, see schools that do yeah. single gender and right. STEM and right. arts and, and I think right. parents need that. Right. They deserve that. Right. Right. So STEM is a, an acronym that you just used, and there's uh, tremendous uh, progress happening. And say what the acronym means. Science, technology, technology, engineering, and math, I believe. Right. So the, these are areas that have not necessarily been strengths, but in an increasingly technological society, right. uh, if you're going to be able to enter the job market, having uh, some focus there and for kids who have an aptitude for that mm -hmm. to have schools that really focus on that is is tremendous we have well. two million unfilled stem jobs in this country today two million yeah and we're now limiting immigration in certain ways that are yep. continuing to make that less yep. likely to be filled so yep. filling it from within is a tremendous is critically important critically important yeah all right speaking of critically important now let's get to the funding at the state okay. level because you have been appointed by the governor to be part of the commission on texas uh, education funding mm -hmm. and that group is going to present its findings in december Correct. and be prepared to be addressed by the legislature mm -hmm. uh, in uh, this next session in, in 2019. So I know you can't reveal uh, what's going to be coming of that, but what's at stake? What's really happening here that is so out of balance that we've really got to pay attention to this? So I think what's, what's at stake is uh, the prosperity of Texas, in my opinion. Um, if you look at the fact that we set a goal three years ago, led by the governor, that we're going to get 60% of adults aged 25 to 34 to have some type of post-secondary credential. Today we're at 42, yeah. and that 42 is a blend of what we produce with our own pipeline and what we import. Mm -hmm. What we produce with our own pipeline is 21%. Wow. 21% of every eighth grader in the state of Texas, 10 years later, six years beyond their scheduled high school graduation, has some type of post-secondary credential, wow. one in five. So we can't import our way to 60, Mm -hmm. And if we and we've got to figure this out and, right. and to allow all kids to participate in the prosperity of Texas. Right, right. So historically, there was a kind of expectation that about half of public school funding mm -hmm. would come from local property taxes and mm -hmm. about half from the state contribution. Mm -hmm. That is down to about what thirty eight percent from the state right now. Correct. Which means that every every dollar uh, that is added to public schools uh, is coming now from more local property taxes as opposed to the state. And, and, and what that also means is there is a recapture process, right? So uh, now more than 400 districts mm -hmm. are contributing dollars beyond themselves to other districts in order to equalize that. How do you address that? How, how can we redress this balance? <laughs> So I think at the end of the day, um, the balance between local property taxes and what the state contributes, which comes from gas tax, fuel tax, sales tax, et cetera, historically has been at this 50% ratio. Mm -hmm. Because of the prosperity of Texas and the fact that it's a desirable place to live, I and mean, you have so many people importing coming in who need homes as well, the values of properties have gone significantly higher. And the, based on how the formula works, mm -hmm. the state contributes less. Now the state can always say, no, we're not going to. We're gonna basically figure out how to do it otherwise. And I think that if I had to, if I had to state what I think is gonna happen, I think what you're probably gonna see is you're gonna see a recommendation to compress property taxes. Mm -hmm. You're probably gonna see a recommendation for the state to contribute a, a greater share. Whether or not that needs a new revenue stream, we'll have to see what the control of the currency comes out in terms of what the economic activity looks like for the state, mm -hmm. how much are sales taxes up, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I think politically it's unpalatable, I think, mm -hmm. for Dallas, Houston, Austin, mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got obviously a wealthy, wealthier districts like Plano and, and Highland Park to be contributing into recapture. Right. And so I think there's gonna be a, 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 a desire to try and reduce the number of districts who are seeing so much of their revenues go outside there and staying within education and staying within their district. 
Well, and, and, and what we've seen, of course, over the years with recapture, popularly known as the Robin Hood plan, right. Right, is that monies get sent to communities that end up building beautiful football stadiums and all that sort of thing in ways that, that then sort of undermine the whole concept, right? I mean, it, 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 it shouldn't be that those monies are, are used to uh, build up uh, extracurricular kinds of activities for other schools when what we're really driving toward here is equalizing opportunity in education everywhere. So the key things I like to say is Texas uh, is the second highest state in percentage of kids who are English language learners. Mm -hmm. We are the 12th highest state in a percentage of kids who are qualify for free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. We rank anywhere from 38th to 43rd in funding. Wow. So given we have much higher challenges, we are below average in terms of what we fund. And when you look at outcomes, uh, we rank in the 40s in reading mm -hmm. and we rank in the middle of the pack in math. Texas doesn't, isn't a, doesn't settle for mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question in my mind that schools are doing relatively very well with, with the money that they're given. It needs to be, they need more resources. And what we've recommended through our work is that let's focus on some key strategies that we know based on data will really move those outcomes. So right. let's invest and provide full day uh, pre-K right. if that's what a district wants to do, or if they want to use the money for other things that enhance third grade reading. Right. Let's make sure our best teachers make more and sooner, mm -hmm. and let's make sure that the whole system and districts support kids in accessing a post-secondary education of some type of for, for, form or fashion. That could be in the billions of dollars, but I think it'll be money well spent. So, Todd, help me and help our, our listeners and viewers understand how we break through what seems to be a partisanship on these matters. Surely, every this this these matters can should not be broken down to Republicans who don't want to fund public education and and Democrats who do, mm -hmm. because Democrats want more taxes and more money, and Republicans want less. Right. I, I mean, many Republicans in this state know what's at stake and want uh, to to see quality public education. Do you see hope and progress among uh, those who are reaching across the aisle and trying to figure out common cause on I, this? I absolutely do. I mean, there are 13 members of this commission. They were all appointed by Republican governor, lieutenant mm -hmm. governor, and speaker. A couple of them are Democratic representatives. But I would tell you one of the biggest surprises of this whole process for the last nine months is that if I looked at those 13 people and listened to what they say and the questions that they ask, they realize that we need to invest more in public Good. schools. They're going to vote yes. The only question is whether or not they're going to, is it going to be somehow tied to outcomes or tied to strategies that clearly work with data versus I'm going to give you X dollars and you get to spend any way you want. Yes. And there's a, there's a balance there, right? Because sure. local control needs to be important. But the data is so overwhelming, and you got 1,200 different school districts across the state doing different things. Right. I think if the data says incentivize, incentivize this thing or that right. thing, that right. makes that makes that to be smart funding. Well, I, I think when, when you look at what we all want, it's good government. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just less government or more government, but it's smart government. right government, <laughs> smart government, yep. good government. And I don't think anybody, well, most Texans, I think most Americans are willing to pay for good, smart government. Right. And so when you start talking about data drivenness and outcomes that are proven and, and, and know that you're going to be really making investments, not just passing out money. It makes a difference in people's motivation. Absolutely. And every year about 200,000 kids graduate high school and six years later don't have a credential. Yeah. If they did get a credential, it would be about a $200, million, $200 billion injection in the Texas economy. Wait, say that again. If they did get a credential within six years following high school, they would have two. They would have two hundred billion dollars more in lifetime earnings from each and every graduating class. That is about one eighth of the Texas economy. So think about what that means, just in economic terms, right? Oh yeah, forget I mean, about the moral issues. Just the right. Read me. So if if your orientation generally is about business and, and economic life and all of that. This makes sense, not just as a matter of social policy, but right. as a matter of economic policy and about participation for all of us to be able to be better off and, and flourish. They'll buy more cars, they'll buy more houses, they'll, I mean, right. it, it, it'll just create economic activity. And if it's inclusive, then it lets everybody participate. But we have to vote. We do. November's coming along, and we have local elections mm -hmm. that are traditionally very poorly um, 
participated in. Right. Fortunately, this is being tied to uh, larger state and national elections, and that's that's really helpful. I think that it's not in terms just of turnout, local, yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of turnout. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether you're prone to vote for a Republican or Democrat, the the key is on these matters. What is your representation re representative? Uh, going to do to care about the success of, of education in this state, right? I, I would say it's critically important. It's, right. it's certainly how I tend to vote and how I tend to give. All right, so, so those of you who are watching and, and listening to this, if you really care about what we're talking about here as we do, yeah. uh, would you go to the polls? Please. Uh, make sure that you cast your vote, and uh, it's a vote uh, that's uh, not just yours, but it's a vote for uh, all of our communities and for generations to come. Thank you, Todd, for all that you do in to helping here. us understand this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care. Terrific. The Commit Partnership is focused on the powerful idea that every child in Dallas County should receive an excellent and equitable public education, preparing them to flourish in college and beyond. The partnership works with public and private schools, colleges and universities, foundations, nonprofits and businesses to solve DFW's biggest educational challenges. Find out how you can take the journey with us. Visit thecommitpartnership.org.